Hello, everyone. Welcome to Audubon Society of Central Arkansas's meeting. I'm Dan Scheiman, the vice president. And tonight, I'm happy to present our guest speaker, Douglas Zollner, who is an ecologist with the Nature Conservancy, currently serving as the director of science and strategy for the Arkansas field office based here in Little Rock. He's been working with the Nature Conservancy for 29 years. He has over 40 years of working experience in ecoregional assessments, conservation strategy, planning, ecological restoration, fire ecology, ecological modeling, and developing and implementing measures of conservation success. Uh, there's not a topic that Doug is not familiar with in my experience. <laughs> He's received a BS from the University of Arizona in watershed management and a master's from Texas Tech University in the ecology of arid lands. He spent the 1980s working on conservation projects overseas, mostly in eastern and southern Africa. And tonight he's going to tell us more about the Nature Conservancy and its preserves. Take it away, Douglas. Thanks, Dan. Good evening, everybody. I see some familiar names on the, on the screen here. Good to see some of you. Um, what I'm gonna go over first is just a few of, I mean, our major strategies that we're working on here in Arkansas, conservation strategies, and then talk a little bit about the preserves. And I'm gonna, Hopefully, I'm going to start by just putting the strategies up on the screen. Are you seeing that, everybody? Yes, sir. All right. So those are the strategies. I'm not going to read them to you, but I am going to go through them in a series of slides. So protecting water, restoring the delta, living with fire, inspiring people for nature, and adapting to climate change. We go. I figured that out. So, if you think about Arkansas in the context of North America or globally, there's a whole suite of biodiversity that are, is kind of our responsibility as Arkansans to conserve for the future. And the, most of those species are living in our waters. And Conservation of our waters and our streams is probably our top priority. What you see here is a picture of our Mulberry River Preserve. I was just out there last week. It was very pretty. And the suite of species that I'm talking about are mostly small fish, crayfish, and mussels. There's about 100 of these species that only exist in Arkansas and maybe another 200 species where, where Arkansas is the central part of their range, although they kind of have spread out into some neighboring states. And if you're gonna conserve water, you have to think about where it comes from, or where it lands when it rains. And mo much of it lands in Northern Arkansas in an area that is underlain by limestone, karst. That's where our caves are, our underground rivers, that are the headwaters of most of our, many of our major rivers that flow into the Mississippi. And so a few years ago, when we were trying to figure out what to do about that and what the problems were, we developed a tool called DRASTIC. Can't remember exactly what it stands for, but basically it's just a threat analysis. Analysis of the landscape in the northern part of the Ozarks underlain by limestone and where the threats coming from the surface are, because the threats to the underground water are all coming from the surface. And so if you look on the, in Northwest Arkansas, where it's a lot of red. So what's going on up there? 
but we know it's one of the fastest growing urban areas in the nation, one of the top 10. And so development pressures are very high. And then in the Eastern part of that area where we don't have a lot of development pressure, but we're getting a lot of clearing of land for cattle ranching. And in the middle where the threats are low, that's mostly national forest. Along the Southern border of this area, you see some areas in yellow. That's mostly because it's being converted to industrial pine plantation. And so by, by doing this regional look at where the threats are, you can then prioritize your work and start addressing some of the most severe threats early on. And just having the map allows you to start making land use decisions. This is Cave Springs Cave. It's actually a natural area now. And it is the home of three federally listed species. That's crayfish and cave fish. And the cave itself is in the striped area. But what we did here was a vulnerability, vulnerability assessment where we were trying to figure out how the water that lands on the surface is entering the recharge area. So it's a recharge assessment. How is it entering the cave where the animals are? And that let us, let us show where it was in, wouldn't be suitable for development. And you can see how this curve in I-49 goes out toward the east as it passes over that recharge area. We were able to use this information to get the highway department to shift the route of the interstate highway and take it out of the recharge area. And this kind of information for KARS now is pretty well developed and is incorporated actually in the Washington and Benton counties regional planning efforts. So we have it for all the counties across Northern Arkansas, but in Washington and Benton County where they're getting most developed is where it's mostly being used. And then as that water comes back out of the underground, back to the surface, into our rivers, the next thing we're thinking about is, well, how much water do we need in the river to maintain the biodiversity, to maintain the fish and the crayfish and the, and the mussels and the ha their habitat over the long term. And so a few years ago, in our, one of our first big pushes to change policy in the state over water use, we worked with various partner agencies on a new state water plan. And that plan actually set out a methodology to assess all of the rivers in Arkansas, basically from Northwest to Southeast, systematically and do a hydrologic analysis of how much water has to be in the river to maintain life. And that becomes a regulation enforced by a the Arkansas Natural Resource Commission as people withdraw water for public use. Or in the case of when we are seeing the gas development going on around Clinton up in Van Buren County in, in the Lower Red River, we could show that they were withdrawing too much water and they were withdrawing too much water in the summer when water in Arkansas usually is already low in the rivers. And we could use that information then to help enforce the regulations that, main, would make, that should make, be maintaining water flow. And it was pretty powerful effort. And in an interesting side note, our major partner in this effort was the Farm Bureau, who we don't we often don't think of as, <clears throat> as someone who 
is desirable in setting regulations on private lands, which is what this does. It actually restricts water use with, by riparian landowners to some extent. And the Farm Bureau's story was, it was better to know than not know. And they worked through this all the way through till we got it to the legislature and it took about five years, major effort. So in theory, not always in practice, Arkansas has relatively robust way to figure out how much water they need in all their rivers, how much might be able to be withdrawn for, for other uses and to enforce it. In practice, Practice doesn't always follow perfectly along with that, but the, the basis for that, those regulations are there. So once you once you're kind of get control of water withdrawals, you start thinking about some of the major impacts on our rivers. And the first one that raises its kind of ugly head is sediment. All of our rivers are suffering from an excess of sediment inputs. When you do the, the watershed analysis to see where this sediment is coming from, one of the major sources is our dirt and gravel roads. This is a very common picture that you should be seeing right now. And if you kind of draw a land, draw a line there on where the where the hillside used to be you can actually calculate the tonnage of sediment that's flowed into the streams. And it's enormous. It's an enormous problem. And followed by most of those, most of those dirt and gravel roads cross rivers, either with or without some kind of structure. And those structures are barriers to the migration of the animals that use the river. And so we have a compounded issue with our roads, putting sediment in the river, but also blocking flow or blocking migration patterns. And you can do an assessment of these watersheds pretty, well, I wouldn't say easy, easily, but there's a tool for that. And you can kind of see it up in the corner there where that's the alum fork of the Saline River. And basically what we've done is highlighted the roads that are contributing most of the sediment to the Allen Fork and in color coding those cro river crossings, which are most causing most of the problems in preventing migrating, migration up and down the river corridor. And then you can do something about it in a way that's smart, not trying to do everything at once because you can see how many low water crossings there are just, that's the Mount Ida Road there where the, all those dots are. It's a major haulage road for the timber industry. And there's a, I don't know how many low water crossings there, but there's maybe 20 or 30 just along that one road. But not all of them are equally bad. And those are the ones you can concentrate on and fix to improve habitat. And it's similar with roads. Most of these roads are maintained by counties rural Arkansas counties, low budgets, relatively you know, untrained road crews who probably learned how to run the equipment from the previous guy who ran the equipment with no particular training in, in road maintenance or road construction. But there are techniques and, and there's a very good center for dirt and gravel roads who knew before we got involved in this at the University of Pennsylvania. And we, they came down and helped us set up a series of, of workshops of which this is demonstrating some road techniques to train county road crews in, the, in, a, in a way that they can maintain roads which have some upfront costs to do it right, but over time save the county money. You don't have to be grading a road every year. If you, if you build it correctly. And we put every county in, in the highlands uh, through this workshop over a period of five years, us and our partners. 
And as we were doing this, we also, knowing funding is always a problem for, for county governments, we were able to get a passage of a bill in the legislature that funds a program to rehabilitate roads that are in bad shape to the tune of about $3 million a year, which is small change when you think about how much the highway department spends on roads. But for a county, when, you, when, they, when they're fixing those roads that they always have to go back to after every rain, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And it was surprising to us because we had never done it before or worked with, with these particular, this particular group of people, but the road crews themselves were pretty, were really fun to work with because these are not people who generally go to workshops or really have any training. And so, but they know their equipment and they, they absolutely know where all the problems are because that's where they're always going back to the fix. And being able to go to a place in their mind, going to a place and actually fix it so they don't have to go back to it for five years, that was like great. So it was a very enthusiastic group of all men, surprise, but a very, they really welcomed us. And, you know, as a conservation group, you kind of sometimes don't know what you're, if you're welcome or not necessarily. But for this group of people, it was really great for them all to get together in a workshop and talk about their problems and how to fix them. And how, and then go into how all their equipment works. It was, it was all fascinating. Well, the second issue with all of our streams is, the, is a picture like this. And if you canoe or go down our rivers, you've probably seen miles and miles of rivers in this kind of shape. And this is not natural. This is not how river banks should look or look historically. So what happens is two things are impacting these rivers at once. One is the sediment from all those roads. And a lot of this is historical sediment from the time of, even from the back till the time of settlement itself when we first came into Arkansas. And once the river starts filling up with sediment, the river itself tries to reshape its channel and bashes into its banks and it starts, it starts this calving action. At the same time, these banks were being cleared for pasture and the trees were being taken away. And so consequently, you have a river that's not stable and you have no trees holding the bank in. And so the, the river is widening and calving its banks, causing more sediment to go into the river. And that's not a good situation. And if you can stop the input of sediment and reforest the floodplain, eventually that river will figure itself out and create a new channel and the banks can, re can be restored, especially if they're forested. If that can't be done, you know, there are other, there are other things you can do, other techniques used. This is a technique that we used here in Clinton because the airport was losing its land to the Archie Fork. And what we did here is something called natural channel design, where we just reformatted, reformatted this Archie Fork here. This is just before it flows into the reservoir and recreated the channel and didn't wait for the river to recreate it itself. And, it, and sometimes that's a technique that you have to use, especially when you can't let nature take well, they take the time that it needs to restore a river on its own. That's kind of what the new channel looked like when we were done. And then there's convincing everybody this is a good, this is a good idea. Because most people, when they get a bank like that, what do they do? They rock it. They put rock on it, hope it shot rock, usually small rocks. That doesn't work. It hasn't worked for 20 years, and it's still not going to work 20 more years if we try it. So don't put shot rock on your bank if it's right. Because that's just going to fall in. The next flood is going to take it all out. You actually have to control the river in a natural way and replant trees on the floodplain so that there's something in the ground holding the soil together. You wouldn't build a you wouldn't build any kind of building without rebar. You can't expect these banks to hold themselves together without tree roots. 
In the Delta, the sediment problem is slightly different. And that's because most of the rivers, small and large really, in the, in the Mississippi alluvial plain have been channelized. You can see this is where the Cache River flows into the White River, and it's completely forested. I mean, there's more than 300,000 acres of really nice bottomland hardwood forest there. So this problem in this area is not because the floodplain is unforested in the lower White Basin. It's all coming from upstream. And that's what the Cache River looks like upstream in the summer. How much habitat, useful habitat for fish and mussels and crayfish do you think there is in this river? But again, there's our, there are ways to address these problems, multiple different ways. One of the first attempts we made was at Benson's Benson Slash or Benson Stream out near Brinkley. And we took this ditch, which is actually now on the Benson Creek natural area, but at that time was a private landowner. Um, and basically we found a reference stream and we had to go to Tennessee to find, find a stream that was actually in what we thought was the historical condition. We couldn't find any in Arkansas. And we use that as a model then to replace the river's natural sinuosity and depth and flow. And it was fairly simple. We did it in one summer. And it's always nice to have data when you're doing a, any kind of project so that you can kind of say, not only did I do what I said I was going to do, but it had the impact that I said it was going to have. My prediction came true. And all this graph shows in the purple line is rainfall. But in the blue bars, that's total dissolved solids. And you can see right here in the middle is when we opened the new channel. And we went from high rates of total dissolved solids to minimal rates. And we've used that since then, used this data and that, those techniques to restore right around 70 miles of ditches to their natural channels. To, it's, it's not the historical channel, it's a, it's, a, it's a natural design of a channel that we just imposed on the landscape because we don't know what it looked like actually before they just did as close as we can get. And we've also done it on, on the Cache itself, Lower Cache River, where we actually took the, in that case, it was a little bit easier because the natural channel was still there, but it, there was a ditch down, down, down the middle of it. And all we had to do really was hook up the old, old channel, the old curves and old oxbows and block the ditch and the river went back in its old channel. And we had the same kind of, the same kind of uh, results in the forms of reduced sediment and increased biodiversity. So it's a really interesting and, and useful thing to know how to do. And you know, there's thousands of miles of ditches in the Delta, so 70 isn't gonna fix your problem or the problem, but it's a start. And on top of that, We've made a lot of progress in reforesting re relatively marginal agricultural lands back to forest at the rate of about, since 1992, 5,000 acres a year. And that's just uh, projects that the teens, the Nature Conservancy has been involved in. Our partners have done another 100,000 acres. So the total amount of forest land that's been restored to the Delta is right around 225,000 acres. Since the, since the early 90s. It's a huge success. And we're still going, going forward at the rate of about 7,000 acres a year now. The bio view, and this is a kind of a just funny number, but if you look at just bio views watershed, at the peak of the, of the clearing, it was 91% deforested or 9% forested. And now it's 71% forested. 
I mean, 71% 70, deforested and 29% forested. And so we've increased, you know, we're not there yet because we're going to need a lot more forest along that riverbanks than we have now. But that's, that's a reforestation rate of about 1% a year in the watershed. And we've concentrated, as, as you can see on the map, we've concentrated our reforestation efforts in particular areas to try to build up the landscape and not have it scattered shot across the whole delta so, so that we have concentrated areas of forest along the stream corridor. And some of those trees are now, you know, 25 years old. And the delta grows fast, trees very fast. And you can almost see, oh my gosh, this is going to be like a forest pretty soon. And not just like a trees planted in a field. So that's kind of the water, the water situation, at least with the Nature Conservancy and what we're working on. Habitat is a is is kind of the second big strategy. And when we when we were first doing some of our assessments and investigations, looking at particularly at species diversity and, and what species were declining and, and on the endangered species list or candidates for, for listing or you know, on natural heritage's high rank, G rank and S rank species. If you look at that list, this is about 300 species, 42% of them are declining because the forest or their habitat is too dense and not being burned. These are farm maintained landscapes and, and forests and, feet and grasslands. And without fire, they turn into something else that is no longer suitable habitat for those species. And some of these species were really quite common um, at the time, even re as recently as the 50s and 60s, like Northern Bob White, but is not common any longer. And so we started a big push for restoring fire to these lands, to these fire maintained landscapes back in the early 90s, when there was very little going on in the way of fire management in Arkansas, except on some private lands. And it's pretty interesting that a lot of the information that we used to begin the program came from private landowners who had never stopped burning. Their grandfathers had burned or their great grandfathers had burned their, their land and they had just kept it up. And those were the places that we were actually going to in finding these species that were in decline everywhere else. We put together a fire crew to begin, to begin teaching ourselves how to burn and, and what the impact burning would have on different habitats. We burned our own land first just to kind of prove to ourselves that the changes that we were making were were what we, we thought, you know, what they, we thought they should be. And as we did that, we started working with our partners like we, like we always do and brought them to our places and they took us to our, their places. And we built up a body of knowledge that let us expand this widely. When we started back in, and this, these are some of the places you can go to now. This is actually Prairie Ridge. It's a nature preserve down near um, Arkadelphia. You know, this is this is up on um, near Hector on the old Bayou Ranger District on the Big Piney Ranger District. And we built up enough information to start thinking about well, how much of this fire do we need to do every year? Let's figure out how many how much habitat we have out there, how much it's not in very good shape, what kind of fire does it need at what kind of rotation, what kind of scale, what kind of intensity. And it took us a few years to work. We worked on that for a few years. And basically, you come out to a pretty big number of when you think of annual burning. Remember, in 1992, Arkansas was burning about 5,000 acres a year. And the number that we come up at, at for an annual burning is about 650,000 acres a year. And so that was what we were reaching for at that time. And we've made great progress. Uh, before COVID, our, uh, we were at about 420,000 acres a year of annual burning. 
Much of that was on the national forests, but also on almost all other public and a lot of private land around Arkansas. And we're seeing the results of that in our assessments of the landscapes, better habitats and species that were declining now maintaining themselves or maintaining their populations. And we also, as we were doing this and people and land managers particularly started seeing the benefits in both, especially in animal populations, but also in other kinds of habitats, the demand for these kind of fire skills that we had developed with our partners uh, caused us to create a workshop on ecological burning that we hold every year. We, this is, last year was our 22nd year and, and we're teaching people all we know, all we think we know in some cases, to use fire to reach their land management goals. And I guess we're teaching about 40 people a year. And then these people are going back to their agencies or to their private lands and, and implementing in implementing fire. And, and all those people we have taught, many of them now are in relatively high positions in various agencies like Game and Fish and the Forest Service. And they now have this background of fire management that was missing from these agencies' cultures previously, which is how we kind of we're able to reach the numbers that we're, we're seeing today. Combined with that, <clears throat> there are places and times when fire, fire is too risky of a tool, let's say, to restore someplace on its own. And we've developed some interim management techniques, especially in very dense forests, where you can thin them to a certain level before reintroducing fire. And you'll see a lot, if you go travel to National Forest in particular, you'll see a lot of that work going. And so when you go, when you go to from 5,000 acres to 450,000 acres, even though it's over a period of time, you put a lot of smoke up in the air. And you know, and this is a, this is something you can't do if if you're not explaining what you're doing it for, because all you're doing is annoying people. I think it was in something like 1998 or 1999, where a big fire on, on, the, on the Ozark National Forest, maybe on the Pleasant Hill District, actually <clears throat> shut down junior league baseball in Fayetteville. Big cloud of smoke just went over to Fayetteville and just sat, sat over the city and they had to cancel. So we had a lot of, feedback and it was not all positive feedback. And part of the issue is, you know, we are very urbanized, even Arkansas, which is probably one of the most rural states in the union, is very much an urban society. And even in, and we had created all these great little places people could visit in the woods and see before and after fire restoration and see all the treatments, but you know what? not very many people were actually getting out there to see them. And so what we did is we changed, <clears throat> we changed our methodology and we started burning really first, first here out at Pinnacle Mountain, but also all around Little Rock at Burns Park at Lawrence Creek and some other preserves we have in West Little Rock, but also in every, just about every urban area in Arkansas because people had to see the results and see what you're doing and realize why they were seeing smoke. It wasn't just people having fun. It wasn't necessarily a wildfire. It was people trying to get a habitat condition for, for animals that was more suitable. And that has been very successful, very successful. Um, Pinnacle Mountain, it, I don't know if you, if you went there 20 years ago was, pretty much a completely closed in forest, hard to even walk through. And now it's quite beautiful. You should hike off the trail. On the trail, it's not so beautiful. And related to that, this gets into kind of our people issue. And I don't know, everybody's experiences are different, but the reason I got into conservation was because I lived in more or less a rural area 
and I was familiar with the woods and I grew up in the woods. And that was almost a second home to me. And I think many of us, many of the older generation had that opportunity to become familiar and comfortable in the woods or in wild areas while they were growing up. And kids these days are, are pretty heavily managed and they don't have those same opportunities. And if you think about the future, of course, if people don't realize the benefits or, or kind of the greatness of being able to go out in a wild place and recreate and understand the forest and, and the animals and, and all that goes on there, we won't, ultimately, we won't conserve what we want to conserve. It, it just won't happen. And so starting about six or seven years ago, we took on what we call inspiring people for nature. And it has a couple different components to it. We, we bought, or in, in this case, we're donated land around Arkansas in, or went after these in particular to set them up as a place for people who live in the city to experience nature. And I don't mean nature in like at a park, at a city park. It's not a soccer field. Those are all great places. But this is a, these places that we purchased and developed for recreational activities were very much done it so they could do nature-based activities. One of our first ones was out at Nat Ranch North Woods. It's a beautiful place, you know, but it's an old, it used to be a soybean field. Ecological value was not high. But what was high here was that we could take people easily from the city there and let them do all those kinds of um, nature activities that we think of when we think of going to the mountains. They can canoe, they can bike, they can camp out. We developed a, this is a camping plant form out near Bio to View where you can get on a water trail and go for miles and miles through, you know, beautiful bottomland hardwood forests and camp out. And we involve people in our restoration activities at a scale that uh, previously we, we just never even considered. But it was, and, it, and it's not terribly efficient, actually. It's much more efficient to hire, sorry, it's much more <laughs> efficient to hire a planting crew to plant these trees than it is to get volunteers out there. But the point of this is not that we want to be efficient about it, is, is people have a desire to be involved in conservation and they don't have any outlet for that in many cases. And we provided that, consciously divided, decided to, to provide as much of that as we could. We make our places as much as we can open to people. We have a youth program, Audubon, not quite like Audubon's, but the idea is the same. Nature-based uh, experience and experiential. We, our places are open for our partners to use. This is actually the Kings River Watershed Alliance meeting on our preserve on the Kings River. Other groups, that want to become involved. And what we are finding is that the demand is, is really higher than we can meet for these kind of activities. And it's great. And a lot of that was pre-COVID, as you could probably tell. And finally, I'm going to talk about land because you know the Nature Conservancy really started as a land trust and buying land and conserve, managing it and conserving it for conservation is still a primary objective of ours. And we have in Arkansas at 
is pretty well known. We've done a lot of assessment work with the Natural Heritage Commission, and we kind of know what what in our in our in our dreams what we would buy and protect if we could. This is just a map of the flatwoods, pine flatwoods in South Arkansas, and the black lines are kind of our goals. If we could fill in all the and the other colors are land, lands we've already acquired. And if we could fill all of those gaps, we think we could conserve most of the biodiversity that relies on flatwoods for their life cycles. And that would be about 100,000 acres. And just to give you an example of what, what it takes, some of you may know about Warren Prairie, Warren Prairie Conservation Area. That's uh, a natural natural area started back in 1989, 1988. So over that period of time, there has been 28 separate acquisitions there. And it's now about 7,000 acres large. And the Heritage Commission has reintroduced red cockaded woodpeckers to it. And there's at least 10 breeding pairs now. There's one right there. The Cherokee prairies. The Cherokee prairies are up near Fort Smith, north of Charleston. Beautiful place all times of the year, great birding. You know, the first track we, we bought there was 80 acres. And that was back in about 1993, 1994. And now the whole place is about 1,100 acres. Not necessarily all contiguous yet, but over time, we're being able to fill in the gaps. Another great, and a great place to go burning. West, out in West Little Rock, it's, it's pretty interesting. We started um, buying land really around Pinnacle Mountain to extend to, toward the West on all the Maumel Pinnacles, which is our goal. We recently uh, completed the acquisition of the last pinnacle, Blue Mountain. It's about 400 acres on just to the west of Rattlesnake Ridge. And that hooks up to about 20,000 acres of central Arkansas water habitat around Lake Maumel. And it's really a beautiful place. And at least Rattlesnake Ridge is open to the public and there's about seven miles of hiking trails there. Another place with a great bird list. Kind of what it looks like looking from the top of the ridge toward Pinnacle Mountain. Going back to the river stuff, there's places, <clears throat> there's places that where we've concentrated on conserving corridors along these rivers. They're highest quality areas usually. This is our preserve on Elm, on the Elm Fork of the Saline River. It's about an hour's drive from Little Rock. There's no official trails, but it's open to the public. Hardly anybody goes there, but it has pretty good habitat. And in the spring, you can walk along the river and see lots of cool birds. That's what it looks like. And finally, this is a place up uh, just north of the Ozark National Forest called Council Rock. It's, it's actually Ricketts Mountain in the Vendor Valley. If you see the white thing east of the red line, the big white blob there, that was the hog farm, the now closed hog farm. And that is a beautiful preserve that virtually no one goes to because it's in the middle of nowhere. It is open to the public. You can drive on, a, on a, one of those horrible gravel roads that I talked about earlier. And it goes up to the south entrance and there's no real trails, but it's beautiful bluff lines and you can camp, wilderness camp, and uh, who knows what you'll find. That's what it looks like from the valley. And then there's, 
another great place that you might consider visiting, and that's at Bluffton Preserve up in, near Clinton on the Archie Fork of the Little Red. You know, we have a great, great swimming hole, campsites, and about seven miles of trails. And it's beautiful right now. I think it's that peak color and it's just a gorgeous place. You know, an hour and 15 minutes from Little Rock or so. That's what the swimming hole looks like. And that's what the bluff line looks like at the end of the trail. So that's all of my official presentation. I was gonna just mention one other thing about bird birding with your Audubon Society. And that is, I put many of these preserves on eBird. And we have good lists in some places and not complete lists in many places. And we would love you all to visit. We, like I said, we own 60 um, natural air, I mean, 60 preserves across the state. About 50 of those are open to the public. Some of them are caves and they're closed, but most of them are open. And I'm sure there's one near you, wherever you live. And I would love to get them all on eBird or as many as I could and start building up our bird list for all these places. That sounds like a challenge. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge for sure. It is definitely a challenge. And a lot of the places we own are adjacent to her natural heritage, natural areas. So you get, you can get two, uh, two places in one there. Yeah, like Kingsland Prairie. Kingsland Prairie is one. Yeah. Definitely. Warren is another. And if you go all the way down to South Arkansas near Felsenthal, you know, we currently manage about a third of the red cockaded woodpeckers in Arkansas. And so if you haven't seen one, I can almost guarantee that you can see one there. There's about 60 birds, or there was during the summer when all the nestlings were out. Well, thank you, Doug. Uh, we have time for questions. You can unmute yourself or you can type your question in the chat box and I will relay it. I'll get started. So you're encouraging people to visit your preserves. Are you planning on building more trails in preserves, especially those that don't have trails yet? You know, most of our places are going to stay more or less natural and you're, you're going to bushwhack probably. Currently, we have seven preserves with a developed trail system. And to, and, and to be completely honest, that's about all we can handle. But you can, but places like Prairie Ridge, you know, you can walk through the prairie. No problem. Yeah, I've been to Prairie Ridge. It's beautiful, especially, I mean, spring throughout the summer when flowers are in full bloom and it is easy walking. Yeah. And the prairies up near Fort Smith are similar, similarly easy. Oh, yeah. So where can people go to learn more about your preserves and how to visit them? So they're all on our website. And you're gonna ask me the website name. <laughs> I think it's nature.org slash Arkansas. All the ones that are open are on the website. Um, and if you, I don't know how much information you're gonna be able to get there, but you can always just email me and ask me, how do I get here? How do I get there? And where should I go? That's fine. Again, feel free to unmute yourself or to type in the chat box. So when it comes to preserving land, and you're, you're eyeing adjacent landowners, do the landowners know that they are being eyed? And when they know you wanna buy it, do they jack up the price? Cause you know you want it so bad? You know, it's, that's always an interesting thing. 
we know, I would say, we know all of our neighbors. We make an effort to make sure we know all of our neighbors. And we don't push very hard. So the opportunity, I would say, the opportunity to do conservation with land purchases and art is so wide and there are so many important places that the jacking up the price would very rarely work. We just wouldn't do it. Can't, we can't really, don't have the, don't have the resources to, to do it. And so we just spend whatever money we had for land acquisition somewhere else. But yes, we know all of our neighbors and they know that in some cases we'd love to add their land to the preserve. So also when it comes to communicating with the public, you said you do uh, these urban burns in part to educate the public about what you're doing. How do you alert the city? How do you alert a whole city? How do you alert Little Rock and the whole Pinnacle area that you're gonna be doing a burn? Don't panic. That's a lot of people to reach. It is, and we can't reach them all. But at Pinnacle, the the park itself has taken on a reverse 911 thing where they can reach everybody downwind by phone on a reverse 911 call. And most cities have that ability. Not so much in rural areas where we have to do, you know, one-on-one -on -one neighbor contacts. But in Little Rock, we mostly can get by with telling the closest neighbors, putting up signs, putting it in the paper, putting it on a website. And then for the people a little farther away, you know, we do the reverse 911. Well, David and, asked, oh, oh, go ahead, Joni. And from the State Parks Director's Office, we help to contact the media. Yes, absolutely. So David asks that he has uh, noticed your headquarters on university. What facilities do you have there? Often we have a shop where we store all of our fire stuff and maintain it. And then we have offices and that's it. So it's just, it's your workspace basically. It's not a nature center. No, that's, that's your your nature is outdoors in the nature it is all it's all outdoors and, and we don't have any nature centers which right now i'm kind of glad of but. <laughs> so again feel free to unmute yourself or to post a question in the chat so you uh, also mentioned that you do some advocacy work that you've you know, worked on the water plan, worked to get funding passed for roads. Uh, does TNC have a grassroots advocacy program where you get your members and your followers and donors involved in this? Um, I would say not a grassroots one, if invo just involving all the general public general public or even all of our members, it's more specific than that. We have a board of trustees, kind of like you do at Audubon, and usually those are the people who are helping us most with our advocacy work. Yeah. They're, for, they're, they're you know, fairly well-connected people in the city, and so people listen to them, I would say. They're very useful. So what are the best ways to get involved with conservation efforts that you do? I would say we have, we have three people working with volunteers or with youth. And, you know, I would just, in Northwest Arkansas, it's Chaz McCoy, and I just call him. And here, here in Little Rock, it's, it's two other people. Um, Devin Shadroff and Leah Beck.
and they would be the contact people. And feel free to contact me and I can put you in touch with the correct person. There's, you know, I, there's different things going on at different times of the year. So depending on what your interests are, I would say you just need to talk to, talk to, talk to people and see where they can fit you in. Well, do you post the volunteer events on your website? Or do you have an email list? We do. Can get onto? We don't have an email list, but we do post it on, well, we don't, we have an email list of people who have volunteered, but for new people, you should get on the website. Okay. All right. Uh, Betty asks if there's a timeline for opening Logan Springs Preserve for public access. There is, and I can't remember the exact date, but it's in May. And we'll see if we get there in time. I, I should mention that my coworker, John Young, uh, recently was harvesting prairie seeds he was. for you yeah. guys to help preserve our, help restore the prairie on that property. Yeah, it's great. He was up there last week. Yep. It, yeah, we are happy to be a, a partner with TNC. Yeah, that's a really great project they have going up there. <clears throat> Any other questions? One last question. All right, well, I'll, I have one last question then. Uh, when was the Arkansas TNC office formed? Um, it was formed, it, we had, they had employees here before 1986, but the office was opened in 1986. Oh. I think the first employee was here in like 1983. All right, good long time. And you've built up a lot of employees since then. You do a lot of great work around the state. And I say, so yeah, I had a general idea of what TNC has been doing, but it was good to see it all in one presentation. And it's a real eye opener how broad the work you do is, but yet it all really comes down to protecting habitats and the rare species, even though you've got to consider karst and roads and rain and water flow and fire. It's, a lot goes into maintaining the places for wildlife and for people. So I appreciate all that work that you and your coworkers do. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody.